Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gary Wilkson Podcast. So glad you joined us today. Hope that you're enjoying this series we're doing on the parables with Joshua West and myself, and we mm-hmm. trust and pray that you've been ministered to. Love for you to subscribe to our podcast and also go back and look at some of the other uh, episodes we did on these different parables. Mm-hmm. We are on our ninth one here today, the parable of the marriage feast. And mm-hmm. if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and read this one. You've been reading the, yeah. the last few, so let me do this one. Give uh, me a break. Yeah, Gary, can you <laughs> give me a break. So, so this is uh, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. Does that sound right? Yes, sir. The wedding feast. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat cows and have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off one to his farm, another to his business while they, the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops to destroy these murderers and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main roads and invite the wedding feast to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all that they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in and looked at the guests, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get here in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness in, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. All right, man, let's dig into this thing. It's, uh, it is, it's, it's, it's uh, unusual. It's bizarre. It has all kinds of uh, twists and turns to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This would be, this would make a really, for a really weird movie, you know. Definitely. Uh, but yeah, maybe unpack it a little bit for us. What do you think's happening here? Maybe what's the main, the main theme of this thing? And then I'll chime in and add some of my thoughts to it as well. I, uh, you know, we talked about this in the last podcast, uh, but this one particularly really does have something uh, very important to do with the coming in of the Gentiles. Mm. This idea that the gospel is for all, <clears throat> the kingdom of God is available to all. Um, and, and, you know, some of the the language obviously is is this idea of, uh, you know, of the father and the son. That's pr- pretty easy to gather. But I think yeah. without getting too deep in it, it's so helpful to understand <laughs> you know, first century context a little bit to sort of understand the gravity of the situation. We mentioned this when we did the parable of the <clears throat> the ten virgins, but I think I think the idea of understanding what marriage really was in society, like the idea of being invited to a a, a, a marriage banquet for the son of a king, this idea that that you are invited to this very important event. Like, I I think our lives are so crowded today that we, you know, we just think, oh, I didn't get to go to Jim's wedding. (laughs) You know, how unfortunate, but we'll send him a gift card. Like this idea of being invited not only to someone's wedding, which which was very, meant a lot, but to to be invited to to partake in someone prominence wedding, um, it would have been shameful to refuse the invitation or to accept the invitation and not show up. So I think that backdrop really kind of explains the gravity a little bit where we have to realize that it wasn't just like they didn't have time to make it to someone's wedding. It's not, it wouldn't be viewed the same way that we view it today. And so this idea of really shaming or, um, minimalizing the, the joy of the King for his son, like, you know, the, the idea of his son being married, mm-hmm. starting a family, rising up maybe to take his place at some point. Um, that's what's really going on here. So it, there's also this idea of honoring the son who will, su- you know, su- secede, not secede, will follow in succession right. of the king. And so I think painting that part of it is is so very important. <clears throat> and then to me, though, like you talk, you know, a few times you've mentioned like, parts that are sort of bizarre. Right. To me, what's really bizarre <clears throat> about this is we understand 
you know, there wasn't refrigerators. There wasn't like once you kill the ox, once you kill the calf, yeah. this is a this is a big deal. It was an expensive thing, and so this idea that that they're making this huge feast and inviting to people to it makes perfect sense to me. Where I get a little sort of like, what's going on here? Is when it says. You know, invite everyone to the, my dinner is prepared, I've slaughtered the calf, everything is ready, uh, come to the wedding feast. It says, but then they paid no attention and went off, you know, he to his farm, to his business, while the, while the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. You know, it seems like sort of a bizarre thing. Like some, <laughs> yeah. of, some of, and there's another parable that Jesus tells too, where they even say, you know, basically, you know, we. I, I'm another version. I think the version in Luke 14. They give some more specific reasons why they can't come, right. um, which is also sort of reminiscent to me of when the a disciple, when Jesus said, "Follow me," and what they say, oh, "I've got to bury my dad. I've got a business to attend to." The language is very similar, but to me, when it just skips from like, "I can't come," "I'm busy," and some of the other ones seized the servants yeah. and killed them, um, I think. Some scholars might point to the fact that this had something to do with the same sort of language of seizing the heir and killing him to gain the inheritance. This sort of idea of not only some of them were <clears> – <throat> some of them were um, – didn't care about celebrating the, the, the king's son – but some of them despised the king so much that they actually seized the servants and right. mistreated them and – killed them when they came to to invite them to this special event. So yeah. I think when we think about it that way, it helps a little bit. But but when you just read it at first glance, it's like, you know, some people said, no, thanks. I'm, I'm working my farm. And some of them were like, well, hey, come over here. I'm going to beat you up or, or right. maybe kill you. But I think that that sort of uh, that sort of context <clears throat> can be explained by the idea of showing animosity towards the kingdom itself. And then, of course, the king's response was he was angry. Um, he sent out his troops to destroy the murderers and burn their cities. And um, I mean, it's, you know, basically the things they were preoccupied with. He, he destroyed all of those things because nothing was more important than the wedding feast. <clears throat> and then we get to the point where he basically says, get everybody you can get. Get everybody, invite them in. And it's funny, it says good and bad. Mm -hmm. Get everybody here. Make the invitation blanketed, right? You know, so it's it's like this this call to everyone. Right. You're all welcome to come. The people who I prepared the banquet for, and obviously we know this is to some extent talking about the Jews. Right. They they didn't value it. So let's open the doors to every everyone. Yeah. But then even the ones who show up, there was still a um, even though you're invited, there was still a reason why that one person who was there was cast out. Right. And so, I, you know, bef I, I think that kind of lays out the context. But before I turn it over to you, I think for me, the, 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 the gravity of this is not only the fact of the significance of the wedding feast, but we're talking about a king's son's wedding feast. Yeah. No, and so the idea of monarchy, even in even it's not the same as it was here, but even in the idea of a monarchy today, we don't even we just can't comprehend that in in U.S. Right. in the U.S. because we just have never thought that way. But like if Queen Elizabeth would have invited someone, a commoner from the from the U.K., hey, come be part of the, you know, that we're going to celebrate Prince Charles, it would have been a great honor. If you go back in time when the king was actually the ultimate authority of all things, you, I mean, the real, you're, you, a king didn't need permission to execute someone. A king didn't need permission to go to war. A king didn't, so the, all power rested with him. So I think that's, that gravity there kind of uh, makes them turning away from this this honorable request, uh, it really shows disdain for the king, the kingdom, and his son. Everything you're saying makes, makes sense, and I think is spot on with what's being said here. The, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really Jesus, he's telling a parable, but he's really telling his life story, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. I've, been, I've, I've been available to you, you know, you, you know I was known... You know, like even the law and the prophets, they look to me. They, they, you know, they look forward to me. I invited you to come. You didn't come, and so that, you know, that's this history. And then there's the present. Now I'm inviting you to come, and I'm opening up that invitation to others. 
And then it's his future. And he's talking about the judgment seat as well. When when he separates the wheat and the tares, there's, there's a little bit of a of a hint towards you know Jesus mentioning that the wheat and the tares would grow together, and then at the last days he would separate them. That's why, because it does seem kind of weird that they're trying to get people to come in to fill the house of the feast, and so this you know you almost feel sorry for this poor guy. So like, hey, you invited me, uh, and then but I'm not dressed right, so you're gonna right. The last one, it's like that's that's yeah. kind of. It almost seems harsh if you don't dig too deep into right. it. Right, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's again, it's like, you know, he, he, you don't separate the wheat and the tares before judgment. You let them grow together or that, so you let you let them come in together. But once they come in, you realize, so it's, it, may, it might be a, a picture of, you know, the invitation of the Gentiles to come in, of us, we can come in. But even if if we're in and we're not, you know, we're, we're almost like uh, false brethren. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the so-called, you know, Paul talks about that a lot, the so-called uh, Christian, not, right. not really in there. And so, <clears throat> so the, yeah, there's la- there's layers to the judgment here. Those who refused, first of all, then, then those who actually went to war against them, and then the other ones who actually came in but wasn't prepared, his heart wasn't right, his, 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 and there's a lot that could be said about that. All are welcome, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, for God so loved the world, this idea of the gospel is for all people of all tribes, of all nations. So the, the, the invitation of wel- being welcomed into God's kingdom is there, but not on your own terms. Yeah. Like to come in, so, so we're welcome. This idea, you know, it's staggering to the Jews, even though Old Testament prophecy talks about the coming in of the Gentiles, but you can imagine over, you know, centuries of, of being God's chosen people, when this actually starts coming, when the king actually shows up and it didn't happen in a fashion they were expecting, um, this idea of we're, we're going to let the, I mean, we even see after Jesus ascends this sort of friction between people, mm-hmm. okay, if we're going to allow the Gentiles in, do they got to be circumcised? You know, this whole idea, but, but I think not apart from Jewish legalism, or, but this idea that you're welcome but there is, you have to be clothed in something to be here. And of course, we know that is being clothed in Christ. Um, so you're welcome, but not on your own terms. Right. And, and I think that picture is, you know, even though this parable was was aimed at a group of people in time, post Jesus' ascension and, and looking at the church that's followed, it's so applicable today because we really do see uh, an idea of people who are expecting to be able to come to God on their own terms right. rather than on his terms. I often have people, you know, who like to say that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. I, I don't like that terminology. Mm. It is a relationship, but it's also a religion. Right. It's a relationship, but it's a relationship on God's terms. Yeah. God d- deems what is acceptable worship. God deems what what it means yeah. to be in relationship with Him, and so it's both. You know, and I think when I'm not being critical if people use that terminology, because a lot of times people's heart means you know mm-hmm. it's about knowing God. Yeah, it's not about law. It's not about law. So I, I, I'm not being yeah. you know hyper against that, but I think sometimes it's unhelpful. Yeah. To say it's it's yeah. actually both. It it is a religion. There is a system of yeah. beliefs that we live by and follow, but but it's formed around this this fellowship with yeah. that we have with God. Yeah, James called it pure religion. So that's a it's not only religion, but it's a pure one. So right. Yeah, there's a couple things that I see in this that might make this a little more uh, applicable to our daily life. Um, mm-hmm. One, you know, and one we're already commenting on is that he's welcomed us in. He's he's invited us when we're not not deserving. <clears throat> you know, we're the and almost like the last pair, pair we talked about. We're the last shall be first. You know, the you know, we, we get to be. You know, he called others and they didn't come, and now he's calling us last, and we get to come in. <clears throat> but the other thing that I think encourages me is in verse nine says go. Therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all of them. So there's a, a second layer of obedience here, not just to come in, but actually get to be people who invite others to come in. Right. Uh, which is this is this would be missional, I would say. <clears throat> it gives a, and so what a what a great encouragement. Um, you know, 
as long as we've known each other and worked together, I don't think I've ever mentioned to you I've had, I, about a dream, uh, but because you, know, you know dreams can be kind of hyper charismatic. But mm -hmm. I did have a dream about this parable one time, and it was real precious. Uh, got invited into the banquet hall, and had this this picture of this beautiful feast, and Jesus was there, and he was serving people, and there's music playing. It was you know lights everywhere, like kind of like garden lights hang, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and then he then in the dream he said to me, oh. Uh, there's a bunch of villages, right? It's like a, there's this hill down there, and you can see the lights in these various, maybe four or five different villages. And he said, "Hey, I want you to go, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, invite those people to come." And he had just put his arms around me, <clears throat> like just before that, you know, just gave me this great hug. And his his dream was just like it was feeling. I remember waking <clears throat> up just feeling so good. When he said, "You know, go into those villages and invite the people to come to the to the to the to the to the hall." Um, it was like a barn. <clears throat> he said, oh, you "Have you know, go in. And I was like, I don't want to leave this embrace. It's like this intimacy with you is more important than going out into the mission field. I, I just, I'm a kind of guy that just, uh, you know, the one thing passion, like be better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere, in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And so I said, like, I don't want to go. I just want to stay here in this embrace. And he said, just start walking and you'll see. And so I started walking in the village and it was so cool because the embrace didn't stop, but he was just behind me now. And he was just like, his arms were around me as I traveled into these villages. So that, and I woke up just thinking like, okay, so it's not two different things. It's not intimacy with Jesus and then a mission. It's, right. it's the mission carries the intimacy. The intimacy is requiring a mission. And uh, so I just encourage people that are following this podcast just to say, man, you, you, you get called into the wedding feast and what a great joy that is. There's one, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb that's coming, but just to get saved is you're in the feast, and then you get to invite other people to it, which is so missing in the Western church, the so few people. Uh, I'm on the board of a, a ministry called Revival Outside the Walls, and Barry McGuire, uh, the, the founder of that ministry, he has all these amazing statistics, and it's really heartbreaking how few Christians are actually involved in sharing the gospel with other people. They just, I, I can't even remember the number. I, can't, I wouldn't dare to try to quote it, but it was just, it, it shocked me. Just so few it's people true. ever share the gospel or ever lead anybody to Christ. Um, mm. And just, it's, you know, go to, they go to church, they have their prayer time. And, uh, you know, they, they, it's almost like the this part is optional in, in a false understanding. It's like, which is strange because, you know, no, none of us think, uh, you know, you hear people say, oh, I was reading my Bible this morning. Or people say, man, I was, you know, I was praying and just the Lord was putting this on my heart. Or, oh, I went to worship services. All those elements are integral to our daily life as Christians. But how rare do you hear somebody say like, oh, man, I was in an Uber last night and I got a chance to share the gospel with this young driver who was just feeling really lost and hurting and maybe just broken up with his fiance, you know, and just all the, you very rarely hear those stories, those stories should be as regular for us as our morning devotion. I completely you know, agree. Most people say, my my morning devotion is a required part of my Christian faith. Not required for salvation, but yes. required for relationship. And 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 so is prayer, and so is fasting, and so is you know tithing. You know, but all of a sudden it comes to witness, like, well, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of waiting for the Lord to put somebody on my heart, or I'm I'm waiting for that divine encounter, but not actually proactively involved in sharing the gospel. And years ago, the Lord just gave me what I call a baptism of love, where I just realized, man, I'm just, I'm not sharing the gospel. And I don't really want to. Uh, I'm, I'm, and the problem the Lord put in my heart was it's, it's, a, it's a problem of love. You, if you love these people, you're going to, you're not going to feel like they're a target and you're trying to put a notch in your belt of somebody I witnessed to. But you're, it just comes natural. It's like, man, I really am interested in this person. I want to know about their life. I want to know about, and, and usually when you show love, their heart opens up and you can minister to them about a particular need because everybody's in some form of crisis. And so yeah, that's, uh, so again, so there's, as you read 14 verses, you're going to see, you know, in verse, verse, first few verses about rejecting Christ, uh, there's then then it's about him opening up the kingdom. Then it's about us getting involved in kingdom work, and then it's about us getting to joy, enjoy the the bridegroom at the wedding 
feast as well. So I love the, even though it's just 14 verses, there's just, it's just so, packed with all kinds of great stuff. It is so packed full of stuff. <clears throat> and, you know, since you brought up the topic of being the servants who invite people, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of different reasons. I don't want to, you know, give hard and fast categories, but one reason people don't share their faith, <clears throat> you know, is because it's superficial. There are people that have a superficial Christianity. And right. so it's very weird to like think about sharing, you know, faith with other people but because it doesn't really impact their life. You know, it's like compartmentalized. Right. That's one group of people. Then you have other people that are devout Christians that really do have a relationship with God that do have private prayer time. But I think, in my opinion, through work of the enemy of our souls, it has been compartmentalized into this idea that it's not loving to tell people things that yeah. they might find objectionable. Right. And I think the idea of 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 having that love in your heart, it's like looking, not to put a notch on your belt, for an opportunity to share the love of God with someone. And so it, it ain't going to look the same way every time. Right. I always like to talk about the fact that, you know, Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. You know, I tell people about Jesus because... You know, when they have a problem, I know that he's the answer to that problem. Yeah. Uh, maybe in an Uber, you know, I'm not, I don't get to all the nitty gritty of certain things, but I, 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 it's not some sort of like myth or some sort of religious tradition that I'm involved in right. or some club I, I'm belonging to. Yeah. The, the thing, the, the void you have in your life, the pain you have in your life, the fear you have in your life is, is solvable by this. Yeah. And, and listen, I think. We we know it's true. People discount it. Oh, sure, you're one of those. Thanks for praying for me. That's nice. But that we 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 have to remember that God hasn't called us to convert people. Right. He's called us to to be the aroma of Christ to people everywhere. And and for some people, this is going to be. I mean, I've had many many times where I share Christ with someone. And the guy goes, Ah, no, thanks. I'm a Muslim. Okay, and then. Two minutes later in the ride, he's like, well, what about, <laughs> well, does Jesus forgive this? Or, right. well, I'm not really a practicing, you just get into this place. We don't even give God the opportunity for the door to open. Right. And I think for me, <clears throat> I would say a little Josh parable that is not inspired. And <laughs> if it is not applicable, I hope it quickly disappears <laughs> from your mind. But, you know, when you talk about the gospel, there's good news and there's bad news. It'd be like if you're on a, a cruise line, you know, big ship and you got information, solid information from someone who knows. They said, listen, even though it doesn't feel like it right now, the ship is taking on water, it's going down. Right. So we need you to start, if you believe me, you need you to start moving towards the lifeboat. Yeah. But as you go, tell other people, don't, don't panic, just head towards the lifeboat. There's room for everybody on the lifeboat. Right. Well, we actually have the opportunity to tell people this. The ship is sinking. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm walking and living this way, going this direction, is because I believe this. I'm heading towards the lifeboat. I want you to come with me. Right. And when we get to the lifeboat, yeah. that boat's going to take us somewhere amazing. Yeah. It's going to take us to this marriage feast. So there's the good news and the bad news. And we have to use the Word of God and discernment on where to enter those things in. But I think I think people aren't convincing witnesses is because very often they're not convinced. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm saying it's like it's not permeating your life to the fact that you're you're living in knowledge of the gospel and the cross. Yeah. You're not you're not applying these things and these truths to your life daily. Because for me, um, not perfectly, and not that I never take my eyes off of it. But this is this is I have communion with God in the morning, and that's what permeates my whole day. And the opportunity to give something to someone that was freely given to me is just part of being a Christian. Yeah. And I think I think that we've been taught to compartmentalize things, and we're looking for this. I'm just waiting for God to lead me. You know, right. I'm just waiting for the Spirit to lead me. He don't need to lead you. He commanded us. Right. <laughs> he yeah. told us to to spread this good news yeah, of the never, gospel. We never say, I'm just waiting for the Spirit to lead me to have my daily devotions. Or right. I'm just waiting for the Spirit to lead me to have my prayer time today. Those are right. things. I, I'm waiting to see if the Spirit leads me to whether I go to church on Sunday and worship with my brothers and sisters. Those are things you just... You just know to do, and as, as so somehow this is probably one of the major things that's been robbed from Christian life is is seeing this as a natural part of our Christian life. And I'd say the first thing is to say, okay, that's there's, that's wrong. Then there's something wrong, 
and then not to feel uh, the, wor the worst response then would be out of guilt and shame is to start, because people are going to feel that like, you know, mm -hmm. you're not enjoying talk to me about this, but uh, that's where this, this baptism of love comes in. I think if people would ask the Holy Spirit to fill them with love for people, and not just lost people, but people. For it's, people. It's not, you don't, you don't put a mark and say, okay, this is a lost person, and I'm, and I'm going to love them, and well, that's a church person, I'm not going to love them. It's just, it's who you are out of the heart. Not only the mouth speaks, but out of the heart, you live your life. <laughs> and so, so as, as people love, you're, you're going to, you're, you're not going to have to start trying to be inviting people to come in. It's going to come out of you naturally. That, and that's, I, I remember the night that the Lord filled me with this baptism of love the very next morning, like in two different occasions, immediately I started sharing the gospel with a group of people. And I was just like, this is not me. I'm an introvert. This is not me. I don't, I can't remember the last time I even witnessed to somebody. And it had probably been years since I'd actually led an individual to the Lord. I had a lot of people come to the altar when I'm preaching and get saved, but it's different. not a one-on-one. -on -one. And so all of a sudden people started getting saved and it's just become part of my, my life. And not to boast, but I've, I've had fun with my evangelist friend, Nikki Cruz, who's, we go out to eat lunch together, you know, maybe once a month or so. And we always seem to end up in, in as a matter of fact, it was last week, started praying for the waitress and uh, it really touched her heart. And uh, Nikki always just like, dude, you're, so kind of, he's saying like, I'm the evangelist. You're the pastor teacher. Like, and I said, no, it's it's not. This is not a gift of evangelism. This is the lifestyle right. of somebody who loves Jesus, and that uh, and that's what I'd love to see people come to know. I think for you know you've, you're talking about being motivated by the love of God, and you know even this parable is is a you know is obviously a launching off point. But we are talking about what propels us to tell people. You know, it is honor of the king. It is the coming wrath and judgment of God. Yeah. But even in those things, it's still love. Right. I mean, it'd be like if I was standing around the corner from a grocery store and they said, we're giving free groceries away to everybody. And then on the other one block up, I meet a guy that's hungry and he's like, yeah. you know, I'm just so hungry. If I'm an introvert, extrovert, I'm like, hey, I know where you can get some food. <laughs> yeah. It's right around the corner. Come with me. That's good. I think one of the things, too, that that is so important when you talk about love is to remember that love is a fruit of the Spirit. You know, when you read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, <clears throat> in the Greek, the tense is almost implying that one thing leads to another. So it's like, because you have the love of God in the gospel and salvation, it's going to produce joy in your life. And that joy will produce mm -hmm. peace. And that peace will produce a lifestyle that's patient, kind, right. good, <laughs> gentle, faithful, self-controlled. And so if we're Christians, we have that fruit in us. But I, I, I also believe that we can that that we can cultivate and like you said, you know, pray that God would, you know, stoke the fire of that love, that, you know, open your eye. Because many times as Christians, it's not that we don't want to obey God or we don't want to minister to people or because we're introverts or extroverts. A lot of times it's just we just get caught up in the rhythm of our life mm -hmm. and we and we we get stagnant because of that and so for me you know it, it's it's reminding me myself of these things but because when because if the spirit of god really lives in you then you have the love of god and i i, I just i but i also need to be reminded sometimes yeah. that i'm on my on my way to somewhere that i i need to be conscientious that there's people all around me that need to hear about jesus and it's not to put some undue pressure on you like you know, that the, the idea that you have to witness to every person you see, it's more like the idea of if you're, the love of God is overflowing out of you, it'll manifest itself in one way to your Christian brother and sister. Mm -hmm. And for the lost, it, the most loving thing we can do is to have it manifest evangelically, Absolutely. even if it doesn't end. The, the last thing I'll say about it is this. I know we kind of got a little off, but I, I think <laughs> it's it's good because this needs to be talked about. I think Christian decisionalism, this idea of getting getting decisions for Christ in the moment, like, and so we do see this at the altar or or whatever. And I'm not against. I want. I to me, it's a great honor that when I get to take the sickle across something right. that other people have sown into and grown, and I get to be the one at that moment that that prays with them and and watch their life begin in Christ. But I think sometimes we think about evangelism like this process we have to do. And if we don't get to point A, B, and C, 
then then it's not worth doing. Like right. we're going to be in a car with this person for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking, we've been conditioned to think if it just doesn't possibly lead into a prayer right. where we're, you know, asking them to surrender their life to Christ. And instead of just realizing that, that it may do that, but just give them what you got. Find the open door. Yeah. You got kids? Oh, yeah. Well, one of my kids is sick. Oh, really? Can we pray for your son? I mean, yeah. these are the doors into Absolutely. these things. And wherever God does with it, he does. Yeah. And, and, and and wanting to lead them to those things. But yeah. I think sometimes we, we put this pressure on ourselves that – that we're not, con if we're not converting people, somehow we failed instead of thinking right. that the, the aroma of Christ is something we should be spreading everywhere. Amen. Amen. Good word. Thanks. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, pray that you would uh, be blessed by this and continue to follow us on upcoming episodes of the parables of Jesus. God bless you. If you're enjoying the podcast, but want to dig deeper, both Gary and Joshua have books that you can buy right now on our online store. Go to worldchallenge.org and click on the store tab at the top of the page. There you'll find books written by David Wilkerson, Gary Wilkerson, Joshua West, and others as well. Check it out today. If you enjoyed today's episode, we invite you to do two things. First, share this with someone else. Second, click on the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're using to listen to the show. That way you get notified when we release a new episode. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you next time.